would be a good idea, so please fill in the forms unless you have an objection to doing so. And uh, this will then be eventually, Leon will put it on the center's website. And Gary and I have been meeting, and you might want to get the word out on this. We've um, decided that uh, people who attend eight of these uh, presentations, there are 17, will get a certificate. So that might encourage people. You do. Yes, <laughs> you'll get two. <laughs> Just a bit of background on Sean. I think everyone here probably knows him, but I, I looked into it. I find out, found out you can just go into LinkedIn without actually being in LinkedIn. <laughs> and found out that he has been educated at a number of universities uh, for, uh, if, if his LinkedIn profile is accurate, and he's worked all over Canada. It is? It is. <laughs> and uh, that's good. <laughs> and Kamloops, uh, including at the Kamloops Immigrant Services and the Youth Network. And he's a member of several provincial and national boards and, of course, has worked in TRU's career ed department for a decade. So, Sean's going to talk to us today on peer learning in co-op. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so it's, it's kind of neat having a small group, so it can be a little bit more intimate. Uh, and I'll keep track since you have to leave at one. I'll try to get through like the bulk of it, and you know, okay, so well, that you don't miss. But uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, you don't make a big change. Okay. Me, <laughs> so uh, as Jenny said, I work in the career education department. I think everyone knows that. Uh, my role there is I'm a co-op coordinator, and uh, I now specifically work in the uh, with IT uh, students, so the uh, computing science students. I moved from the student employment side to the IT side, which is kind of interesting for me because I just finished my MA in learning and technology and I really love technology and sort of marrying that with uh, educational opportunities so it's, it was kind of a perfect fit. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the value of peer learning in cooperative education. Now I'm using cooperative education because that's where I did my research, I focused on that, but I think we probably could open that up to any type of experiential learning opportunities, be it uh, service learning, apprenticeships, practica, that, that, that type of thing. Uh, so, Ginny, you may find that uh, some of this might, might be applicable to what you do with your service learning students. Uh, so what I hope today, uh, some of the objectives, I'm going to do a sort of a summary of a co-op, uh, research and peer learning overview, and then talk about the sort of the technology tools and implementation strategies that I use. So the first part is going to be a little bit sort of text heavy on the research side, and then I'll focus into the more visual uh, aspects of what I use day to day to try to connect and engage students while they're on work terms. So co-op, I, I think everyone knows what co-op is, so this is just a wordle I just threw up there as a visual, but co-op has been around for a hundred years. It actually has a very rich history uh, in North America. Started at the University of Cincinnati in 1905-1906 and then uh, migrated to Canada at Waterloo in uh, approximately 1957. So it has a real rich history, a rich and stable history. So stable can be taken a couple of ways. It can be uh, that it's good, you know, it's stable, it, it, it's, it's well thought out, it's robust, but it also it stays, it stayed the same. It stayed very, uh, I, I don't know if static is the right term, but it stayed basically the same for the last hundred years. So I, when I ever, when I approach cooperative education, I'm always looking for holes because I want to know how can we make co-op better? How can we make it stronger? How can we make it more robust? So this led me to sort of a, a research <coughs> focus. And you know, I, I won't read the whole thing, obviously you can read, but you know, when students participate in experiential learning, they're isolated. And Felicia and I had uh, a conversation just before everyone came here, and I asked her the I asked her some questions. I said, "So, you know, you're here, and do you connect with students that are in work terms in this in the city or within the province or nationally?" And the answer was, um, "Yes, <laughs> I yeah. do. Um, uh, there's been some co-op students, uh, especially from IT program, who helped me uh, kind of." develop some skills that I need in my co-op work term. Now that was a case of where the students were though faced, with, you, were, you were here, located here, which is great, centrally located. Uh, but then I want to recreate her experience with students that are also within the province and also nationally as well. So that was kind of where my research focus was and uh, my um, supervisor was 
very excited because she feels that I've found a hole in the scholarly rec uh, record as well. There's not, there wasn't a lot of information on this, so she really said, she was very excited for me because she said, go for it, because this is something that you can really um, learn more about and then uh, uh, share with others. So I, I started from you know, the, the, my beginnings with two central questions. How will peer learning and co-op affect uh, student learning, knowledge, understanding, and outcomes? What strategies will enhance corporate education through peer interaction? And you know, what technology tools? Because we're dealing with students who are separated by wide geographical, geographic expanses. Big country, right? So how does a student in Toronto interact effectively with a student in Vancouver? And how can we uh, establish those connections, that collaboration uh, amongst those students? So with, with technology exploding the way it has over the last decade, uh, more and more opportunities. There's more bandwidth available, meaning that we can now do full-on video, full-on audio with students, and I can connect them that way. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I really didn't have that opportunity as much. So it's exploring those opportunities, and what I'm going to do at the end is I'm going to show you some actual examples of what, what I'm uh, doing right now. Uh, Gary, you will have seen some of these because I did a previous presentation on technology tools, so some of them are interchangeable. Okay, so the definition, um, I've actually given you a very sort of uh, simplistic definition of peer learning. So the acquisition of knowledge and skills through active helping and supporting among status equals or matched companions. Uh, there are many definitions actually to peer learning. If you go to uh, the research uh, record, there are oodles and oodles of examples of what peer learning is. So I use the very simplistic uh, uh, definition, but for me it really applies. Because as an agent for engagement and encouraging a deeper, more meaningful acquisition of knowledge, so that's really what I, I'm trying to get at in cooperative education. I think someone like Felicia and other co-op students, they, they learn so much while they're on their work term. But I think there's, I think we can go deeper. I think we can go to the next step and have her learn from other, other peers, other students that are in similar cooperative education environments. And that's really what I'm uh, attempting to do. So theory and pedagogy, I, I, I won't like bore you to tears, but I just want to say I love theory. I absolutely love theory. Theory informs my pedagogy. It informs how I interact with students. It informs how I uh, do my instructional design of my course. I really like to understand what makes people tick and, what, and how people learn. And through theory, I can understand, I think, um, how a student um, will, will respond to certain um, instructional um, uh, ways. So if I'm instructing in a certain way, uh, learning or understanding how that student may respond, I am very much a product of my own experience and I learn by doing. So I'm very much a constructivist type of learner where I'm hands-on, I, I, I like doing and I, I retain that more. And it's, it makes sense because of the job that I'm in, in cooperative education, that's exactly what students are doing. They're applying their theory and putting it into practice. So I would consider myself a pracademic. I'm very much a pracademic, <laughs> I think. Uh, so, you know, the work of Dewey, Piaget, Vygotsky, uh, there's many more, uh, Bruner. Uh, it's something that I really like uh, and enjoy uh, reading about and learning about. And so, from a social sort of uh, constructivist point of view, how can I set up an environment for students so that they can learn in a, in a social sort of manner? And that's the, my whole premise around peer, peer learning. Uh, so from my research, and maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll quickly explain uh, what my re uh, how I uh, came about my research. I actually looked at 144 peer-reviewed journals, papers, and, and, and articles, but I pared that down to a working 35 uh, uh, articles. So I actually did a mixed uh, method so sort of synthesis, uh, secondary research. It's not primary research, but secondary research. And what I was attempting to do was trying to find common themes. Uh, amongst the research. And these four were head and shoulders above uh, anything that I uh, was able to find. So learning communities, collaboration, social cohesion, and peer assessment. The first three, the learning communities, online learning communities, collaboration, social cohesion, are very much intertwined. They, um, 
one leads into the other. You can't really have social cohesion without collaboration or a community of, of, of sorts. So they lead into, into each other. The peer assessment though for me is the almost like the capstone. It's what it's it's the icing on the cake, if you will, because through peer assessment, we allow students to really get involved in providing feedback, uh, critique uh, other students, and, and also an opportunity to uh, flip, flip the learning a little bit. They become the teachers in many respects. They're the ones offering from their own experiences and learning uh, the, uh, advice to other students. So I'll just quickly go through some of the communities. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I, I can give you my notes if you like at the end if, if you find it interesting. Uh, so learning communities is very important, especially with students that are all over the country. So trying to establish a community where they feel comfortable, where they feel safe, where they feel that they can make uh, statements without um, any uh, n negative feedback. So establishing that community was, was really important. So there are two types of communities that you could set up. And I put this graphic up to try to explain a little bit better what I'm trying to say. You have here in the, in the larger blue online learning community. So this is, I try to do this through, through Moodle. So I set up a, a Moodle course, as we all do, or Black, uh, Blackboard, whichever one you use. But I use Moodle, and I every week, because uh, Co-op is set up in, in 12 and 24 and 36 uh, week blocks. So you have four, eight, or 12, 12 month uh, work terms. In some cases, you can't even go 16 months. So I set up my Moodle course uh, each week, and uh, each week I either have a sort of a, a video sort of uh, uh, segments, I'll have assignments uh, built in, I'll have <laughs> discussion forums, so I'm building sort of just a general community for the students to go to on a regular basis. But what is really interesting is the personal learning environments because no matter what I set up, students will always find a way to create their own learning environments. So while I use Moodle, they will invariably use other, other online tools to create their own uh, connection points. And so that is, is quite interesting. This in itself, the, the, the personal learning environments, is a whole subject entirely that we could probably talk for hours on because it's, it's really exciting. I know myself as a graduate student, um, our, our instructor would set up in, in the LMS you know, what they want us to follow and we would put our assignments there, we would uh, uh, add the posts that we had to add when necessary, but we always navigated to our other personal learning environments that we set up because they made more sense for us. So as a, as a faculty, as an educator, that's something if you are trying to set up an online learning community you have to be open to that. You have to be flexible and allow students to do that. Because by doing that, you will increase opportunities for learning for students. You will uh, allow them to connect in ways you never even thought of. And that's, that's really important. Okay. John, John, was, was that something that was discussed early on about what the preferences might be, or did it just happen spontaneously? So uh, what I do is I set up, like I said in Moodle, I'll set up sort of the general learning community within within Moodle. Uh, I'll have uh, you know expectations. Um, they know week to week exactly what they want to do, and then I've also provided you know if you would like to uh, use other avenues for communication and collaboration. These are some other samples, but again, invariably they'll find something that I hadn't even thought of. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That, that, there's something yeah. fascinating about that. Oh, it, it's almost like an organic uh, mm -hmm. gathering of students where they are uh, just finding ways that make sense for them. And I, I completely encourage that. I completely encourage that. I'm really more, like when it talks about peer learning, I'm more of a lurker. I'm not so much the educator in this case. I'm more of the lurker in a way. I'm in the background. I'm nudging them along. Uh, posing questions when when needed, and and when they when I'm uh, reviewing their sort of discussions in the forums, I don't necessarily have to respond all all that often, but sometimes I do just to nudge the it along, and uh, they are, are are given us parameters on um, how to comment, making sure that you know they're not abrupt or or things like to that nature. I want to make sure that it's respectful, it's professional. So all of that is given to them beforehand. And um, what I've found so far is, and really, I'm really only in the initial stages to be quite honest with you, because I'm going to be doing more and more of this. 
uh, it has been extremely successful so far. It has, um, the students are blowing me away. I cannot believe some of the things that they're doing, far exceeding my expectations at this point. So I know I, I, I'm on the right track, and through my research, you know, it states that this is something that students will respond to. So the second theme is collaboration. Okay, so once I've set up the online uh, sort of learning community, it leads to the second theme. Uh, collaboration that leads to peer learning will allow students to share their own learning experience and discover the power of learning from one another. And so Felicia and I, again, were speaking before the uh, session today. And we talked about, um, you know, the power of sort of connecting with others, right? And not feeling isolated in their own work term. Because I've, uh, what we try to do as cohort coordinators, we meet with them uh, halfway through a face-to-face uh, -face site visit. So we have that connection. At the beginning of the work term, we try to establish and work with them on learning objectives that, um, say, Felicia will work on with, say, her employer. And, and we hope that, uh, that she will meet those learning objectives as she works her way through the, um, the, the uh, work term. And then we have a number of, of assignments, right, uh, throughout uh, the, the work term that uh, sort of culminates with a work term report. So that's sort of the basics. But, but again, what is missing is that collaborative nature um, of her connecting with other people. She's connecting maybe with me every now and then, or very rarely, probably. But we do not want Felicia or others to have that sense of isolation when they're in their work term. We want them to know that they're supported and that they are also supported by other, um, other students as well. Uh, social cohesion, um, and I'm just going to go to the second bullet point here. You can read the, the top as, if you like. But the feeling of community collaboration and connectedness um, and inclusion are essential to the learning process and development of students participating in the experiential learning environment such as co-op. So in class, face to face, I try to do that. I try to uh, uh, create an environment where students can interact freely with one another, that they feel that they can comment, you know, if I say, uh, if I pose a, a question that they can actually answer. And so translating that into more of a distance type of environment, right? And that, that's, that's sometimes difficult. So creating that social cohesion amongst the group. So if you don't have an online community, very difficult to have collaborations, very difficult to have cohesion. If you have an online community and you don't have cohesion or collaboration, that's not going to work either. So those three really work in tandem with one another. Okay? Now, I mentioned at the beginning peer assessment, the importance of peer assessment. Um, it is an amazing learning tool, peer assessment. How many, does anyone do? Yeah, isn't it great? It's so fantastic. If it's done right. Yeah. 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 It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's very valuable. But I, I think for me anyway, I can only speak from my experience, I take the time at the beginning to explain the process to the students so they fully understand what is expected of them. Um, I even lay out uh, specifics on uh, how detailed they, they potentially need to be in, uh, with their assessment or feedback of another student. So I kind of lay it out for them so they feel as comfortable as possible. I give them a ton of resources on peer assessment as well if they want to do some additional research so they are entirely comfortable with that, with that um, process. Invariably, I've had students come to me and say, well, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to comment. And so I sort of uh, 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 educate them along the way. Um, so I think I, I, if you do a lot of work up front, I think it'll help on the back end <coughs> immensely. So, through the act of communicating, assessing, and critiquing the work of others, I, again, we're transferring the, as I said earlier, the educational process. Um, we're almost flipping the system away because then they're becoming, in a way, the educators. They're, they're helping to educate their, their fellow uh, cohort members. And uh, again, from my own experience, as I said to you before, I'm very much a product of my experience. I know as a graduate student, it was incredible. The, what I received, and I still to this day maintain that if it wasn't for my cohort, I probably wouldn't have learned a fraction of what I had learned in, in my graduate studies. My cohort made all the difference <coughs> in the world to me, and what I was able to learn retain, and it just was such a, a richer uh, sort of learning environment, and that is really what I'm, I'm trying to create within the cooperative education system, a richer environment. 
So here's some examples. These are very, very basic, but I just thought <coughs> I'd show you some of them. So I will uh, break uh, a team to three you're created and they're given um, readings and I just use as an example, maybe the, the subject is on teamwork because a lot of students that go into a cooperative education uh, work term are unsure how to navigate uh, an existing organization, how to navigate the team environment. So if we put uh, something like that uh, as a, as a uh, sort of assignment, students then, then can uh, break up in those teams, work on uh, various norms, and then post those norms on the Moodle site, but then I expect them to also uh, t um, uh, comment on other uh, teams and what their norms are, and then it does a discussion ensues. We have a discussion and we, when we talk about um, uh, the various norms and how they make sense for their organization and their experience. So that's just one. Another one is where I do a workplace mock scenario. So I actually create these scenarios that are similar to what one might expect when they're on an experiential learning uh, 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 term. And uh, we, again, it's through dialogue and it doesn't have to necessarily be text. And I'm going to show you this in a minute. It can be discussion forums for sure, but I also use uh, a uh, video and audio uh, system as well, a uh, web tool that students can engage one another. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be type, you know, 100 word response to that type of thing. Okay? So where are we at here? <laughs> We're just looking through. So, so those are our, a couple of, of uh, examples. So. As a reminder why peer learning is important to me, again, dialogue and discussion provides multiple perspectives, which I think is incredibly important. A safe environment for sharing, and that's one of my number one mantras when it comes to uh, teaching. I want to provide an environment where students do feel safe to comment and not be belittled or, or anything. I want to make sure it's very safe for them. Promote, uh, promote honest dialogue, uh, listen and respond to others, commit to shared goals, and the, the bottom one, which is probably one of the most important, but ultimately helps students to construct meaning and understanding for their specific work terms. So that's at the heart of why I'm, I'm doing this. Um, so before I move on to that, any, any comments or questions around that? I was just thinking it would be very helpful, as Paul commented, um, peer evaluation <laughs> can be effective if it's done right. It would be helpful to uh, uh, to um, maybe have uh, in writing in a one pager, for example, yeah. tips on how to do that. Well. I actually have a rubric that I, I, I give the students a price, so they follow that rubric. Uh, so that that's helpful as well, mm -hmm. and uh, so they know that <laughs> uh, we're you know they're going to comment on certain items that um, this is the rubric that they can follow. Yeah. I'm doing a project right now with an instructor that's doing peer assessment as part of the assessment. And what we did was have the students decide what the criteria for being in the group was. Yep. So as a class, they came up with that. And then in their groups, they signed team contracts. Yes. Our team, well, they weren't quite contracts, but about what was okay in their team. But the, the assessment then that they're doing, the rubric we'll, we're creating for them to assess is based on what their ideas of what's yeah. good, right? Yep. That's um, great. So, you know, they get to participate in that and yep. it works really well. Yeah, that's great. A great uh, uh, way of doing it as well. So now I'd like to move into sort of the some of the tools that I use to try to create these environments. <laughs> this is, now really? we're getting to, <laughs> this we're getting the to, overwhelming part. We're getting to the more visual part of the uh, <laughs> Now, I, I threw this up here for actually to elicit a sort of response like that because you are very, uh, you're right, this is overwhelming. There is no way that I'm suggesting that you do all of these. In fact, I would suggest that you would probably do one or two at the very most. So you pick one or two that you would be comfortable with and you could use that as a tool to help uh, establish the online learning community, the, the collaboration, social cohesion, and the assessment. So. And this is just a small, as you probably know, snapshot of what is available to you. So basically, I choose tools that focus on communication, the social bookmarking, and online collaboration. Okay, so those are the areas that I focus on. Now, I, I've taken two things out of this, actually. I used to have, uh, as part of this presentation, two others. I had green screen um, uh, work that I do. But it doesn't. it's not so much peer learning. It's almost like a... 
a supplement, something that adds to the peer learning. Uh, but uh, if you want, at the end, I can show you some of the things that I've been doing with Green Screen, if, if that's of interest to you after the fact. So this is this is one of the collaboration tools that I use. Mine, my, uh, my student, has, has anyone used this before? I haven't used it. Yeah. So it's an online mapping tool, and what I like about this is that it allows students to map out. Um, a plan. So I can actually give them an assignment, for instance. So instead of writing the report or an essay, they actually map it out in, in a map format how they would answer uh, the, the topic or the assignment. Or if they're in a work term, for instance, uh, and I said to you earlier that I'm working with IT, uh, computing science students, I can give them an assignment to um, path out or map out career opportunities within a certain field of, of the uh, IT um, um, uh, area. So I use this uh, quite a bit. So I would like to show you, Let's. if this doesn't work, I just have to um, make sure I'm connected here. We'll see if I am. OK, I am. Great. Just close this. So this is, uh, by the way, I'm all about free. I like free stuff. <laughs> so. So in, in this uh, particular instance, this is an example of two students. So I've broken students into two sort of uh, areas, and I've asked them to map out careers in software because that was, that was their interest. So it could be anything, right? It could be any topic. So in this particular uh, case, they mapped out what it means to, uh, can you see that? Yeah. No. Is that okay? So going to school, college, or university, they can go, if you, if you follow my cursor, the programming route, testing, business technical, and from that you can, I'll move it down a little bit further, you can get into developing, senior developer, um, uh, more of a, a upper level or and lower junior developer, and then from that you can become a team leader, contract, so it just builds sort of the map of where a student can potentially go in their career, uh, and, and I like it because um, when students come back after the work term back to the classroom, I find they have more of a clear picture of where they want to go. And I think that really helps when they get back to the classroom because it, it, there's clarity, more clarity there. They've taken the theory, applied it to a co-op work term, and then reflected on where they could potentially go with that and they bring it back to the classroom, which closes the loop. And that to me is, is a perfect uh, scenario. Okay? so. On this side here, I'll just show you. Sean, yeah. As you're doing this, so this is I see it's housed online. So, yes. So you can access it if you log in from anywhere to open your. That's file. right. That's right. So, <laughs> so how it works is that so you're in Toronto, I'm in Vancouver. We're working on this document okay. because it is online. You can go in, I can go in and mm -hmm. add, or uh, if we're a team. Uh, we can break it up into sections. I'll work on one section, you work on the others, and populate it. Yep. And then we get together um, to, to finish the assignment. This will then be uploaded into Moodle, mm -hmm. and then for review, not only by me, but other, other students. And then students will have an opportunity to comment on it. Mm -hmm. And maybe from their perspective, they see some, some holes. Maybe they see some things that were mm -hmm. left out that they may want to add, add to. So that's where the peer sort of collaboration uh, comes into play. But it's a nice visual element, and it's a, a, I think students, well, I know students have responded well so far. They've, uh, they've uh, used this. They've even used this to map out uh, a career portfolio. Uh, so it, it, I think it has many applications. So I think we even have here at the bottom uh, even potential <coughs> companies, too. So they've uh, highlighted some companies that they potentially could go to. Oh my god, Leanne is so all over this. Like she stands in these diagrams already, but she doesn't know this. Yeah. So that's, that's just one tool that I use. So that's the, the mine, uh, uh, Meister. And there are other mapping tools you can use as well, right? So uh, I just chose this because of the, I think, the simplicity of it. It's very easy, super easy to use. You can even um, uh, pick out various templates and then populate your, your information if needed. So it's super, super easy. But great for, as, I, as you see in the bottom here, great for group collaboration and a tool for reflection and career development. So the reflection is the big part. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is VoiceThread. Have, have any of you used VoiceThread before? Okay, I use VoiceThread uh, a number of ways. One, I use, this again is an online resource where you can, uh, it's almost like where you're, you're doing a PowerPoint presentation where you can add your 
audio and video, but the great thing about it is you can also respond to my presentation online as well, so there's a, a dialogue back and forth. So I use this a number of ways. One, uh, I have a, a welcome address, so even when students are starting my, the Co-op 1000 course, which is the prerequisite to get into the work term, um, I'll, do a, I'll do a sort of a, a welcome, a hello. They can put a face to the, to the name prior to even starting the class. So I, I do that, and I'll, I'll, I'll just play it for you just to show you what it can look like, and hopefully it'll work. Oh, and Um, my name is Sean Reed, and I'm here with Oh, why is that on? Oh, that should go soon, right? Yeah. I'm really looking forward to working with you this semester. It's like your Zorro or something. It should probably go soon after a few seconds. Um, I think you have a, a great opportunity in co-op. It's, it's a really great... So it's unscripted. It's totally unscripted. Okay, so I'll stop there. So that's just the example, of, that's the welcome. But then also when students are on their work term, I can also um, uh, kind of present an assignment to them this way as well. And I can list because it is almost like a PowerPoint and then I can go to another screen as I'm speaking and lay out exactly what the assignment is. And I think what that does for me a little bit, it, uh, and so getting away from the peer aspect, the, uh, this example, but it, it provides a strong educator or teacher presence, instructor presence. And I think, I don't know, uh, Felicia, if you feel this way or not, but I, I feel like we don't maybe um, connect with the, the students enough. Uh, and, and it's a fine line, right? Because Felicia is busy in her day-to-day -day activity and we don't want to bombard her with with other activities, but I, I feel like I try to uh, establish a, str a strong teacher presence in class, and I want to do that when they're on the work term as well. So this is a way for me to, even though I'm not physically there, at least you, you put a face to the name, I'm, I'm you know, there in video form, <laughs> so in online form. So that's uh, one way I use VoiceThread, but then the, more the peer interaction is the online collaboration. So, I'm just going to stop this before it starts. Okay. So you see uh, my little photo there at the top with my ball cap uh, on the top there. That, so that's me. But these are all people that are in the class. Okay. So I'm, uh, I can, if I'm doing, say, a team activity, uh, if I'm a student, for instance, and I can present my uh, activity to the cohort, to the rest of my students. So I will go through the... Uh, the assignment, I'll provide my results, and then what is great about it is that these people here, some of them have little symbols to represent who they are, some of them put their photos, these people can then comment on my assignment. So that's that interaction, that collaboration between between students. So I'll just... Uh, and this gets recorded, right? Well, well, pardon me? Can it, does it get recorded? Yeah. yeah, this is a, but it's, a, it's online. Uh, and this is the thing, right, uh, when it comes down to the privacy issue. Yeah. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, there's no identifiers of a person's, uh, I suppose, maybe their name, but not no contact information, no student numbers or anything like that. So I think we're in compliance yeah. with the Privacy Acts. Um, so I, I think we're okay there. I was just thinking yeah. as a feedback tool, it would be great if I presented my work and my peers give me and it, it's recorded and I can go back and watch it again later, right? Oh, and, oh that's exactly what this yes. is for. Yes. So you, yes, you could do that's that where you're doing recorded. that. And then you say you provided me with the link, I could click on the link, listen to your, your presentation, your results, then I could uh, offer my own input. And that's the whole point around the feedback uh, and the assessment. No, I guess my question was, is it just live or can it be recorded and used? Over and over and over. Again it's it's reflect. it's meant uh, it's meant to be recorded. Yeah. Yeah. It's Which is different than some of the other tools that yeah. are just live. Yeah. And I'll show you some of the uh, uh, ones, the live tools, in in a second. So this is just me. I'm talking about uh, the online uh, collaborative process. Okay, 
So anyways, I drone on and on and on uh, about that, about that subject. And then this is just, uh, you know, a, a person who has um, responded. It's a little low. Hers is low. I'd have to turn it up. Maybe I'll go to another one here. Anyways, so he goes through, and, you know, and anyways, all of them uh, are able to uh, offer their opinions, their comments, uh, insight, uh, maybe some new direction for us as well. Uh, some of them have actually indicated some uh, problems in our uh, responses, and so that's good because then we could take that and then make the corrections, and that's the the whole point of it. Okay. Any questions about uh, voice thread? Super, and it's free again, totally free. <laughs> Is it something you think you, you would ever use in the future? Is it something you think might be of interest? Yeah. Perhaps? Mm -hmm. For me, it, it makes sense just because of the distance nature of, of cooperative education, right? So that's the voice thread. Time here. Now, uh, Paul will know about Scoop because I've uh, talked to him about Scoop it a couple of times. Because I'm a big Scoop it fan. Yeah, so I use the Scoopit as a social curating tool, and um, and Pinterest can do the same. And then the, the one in the blue is Stor Storify. Uh, so they're all they're all similar. There are many uh, other products you can use, but I particularly use Scoopit because of the interface. So I use it as a way to uh, curate and aggregate data, uh, research resources for students. But what I do in terms of the peer learning concept is that I break the students up into groups and I have them to create a scoop it page and then I have them go out and research and, and uh, aggregate and curate data uh, and resources. And so again, it's a way of almost you know, forcing students uh, to, to go that extra step to do that research on a particular topic. And then they upload that information to Moodle and then it's available to everyone. So you can imagine at the end of a, of a course, the rich uh, data that is uh, uh, available that students themselves have actually uh, done the work on. And so I think that adds to a deeper uh, a learning process for the students. So I'll just uh, click on this uh, for those of you who maybe haven't seen it. This just happens to be my scoop it page on career education. So. What I do is I go through, uh, if I'm on a, a site that is, I find a particular relevance, I will scoop that. So there's a little bookmarklet uh, applet at the top of my uh, computer screen, and it will then capture, it will actually grab that, that screen and put it into this format for students to read. So it's pretty cool. It's slick, right? It's yeah. super slick. <laughs> so, so that's how I use uh, Scoop It. So it started out just for me, actually. It started out, I just wanted to curate information for myself because I found some things interesting. Then I went, hmm, how can I use this with students? And then realized that it has an application uh, to get students more involved in the research process, which, I, which has been great. one this will be the last uh, uh, screen here and you know many of you are going to be obviously incredibly familiar with all of these tools uh, this is more the communication side so WebEx Adobe Connect Blackboard Skype and Google Plus I use Google Plus uh, who here uses Google Plus or Google Hangout it's called yeah and how do you how do you use it Paul poorly no, oh, no. <laughs> okay uh, do you do you use it with uh, students, or is it more for just social? Like how? my personal. Okay. I use it to collaborate with colleagues in other parts of the world. Yeah. Okay, so that's great because that's exactly what I'm doing with students. So uh, Google Hangout allows you to have up to ten people uh, in a full video and audio <laughs> format, which is great. Now, if I wanted to use Skype for that, I have to pay the the up upgrade fee for that. Adobe Connect and WebEx. I think is okay if you're doing a presentation, but to have that free flow of information, I find it a little bit more difficult with those products, to be honest with you, because you either uh, have to uh, click on the put, put up your hand button and then talk, and if you have uh, the mic, one or two or three mics open, there's feedback, 
You don't have any of that in Google Hangout. The one thing with Google Hangout, you probably have experienced this, is um, sometimes uh, it depends on the bandwidth. Uh, so if someone's in a more rural area and maybe their bandwidth isn't as strong. That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, sometimes there's a bit of a lag. But in my graduate studies, I was working with people that were in um, Guyana, uh, in Africa, in Europe. So the only difficulty we had was time zones. That was the, the biggest problem for us. So what I do is I break up uh, into groups of, of 10 or less, and we have sessions with, I have sessions with the students. So I'll pose uh, questions beforehand, and have them, I want them to prepare, but I want it orally. I want them to prepare orally. And then they can come to the group, and then we have discussions on a particular topic that uh, maybe they've uh, raised an issue that they're having in their work terms, and then we discuss it as a group. So is Google Plus sort of like Skype in terms of how you set it up and connect to it? And yeah, with Google Plus, uh, it's uh, obviously a Google product. So you have to download a little applet that gets uh, put onto your computer. And then after that, you, you, do, you set up a, what is called a Hangout, a Google Hangout. And I make circles of friends. So with all of my students, I'll make a circle of my students. And then I can connect with them uh, on a on a case-to-case -case basis. So it's great because, like I said, uh, sometimes uh, the students will then take, after our discussion, they'll take Google Plus and they'll open up a Google Drive uh, a document where they can all work on it at the same time, have the full-on video of eight students, and it's like they're in the classroom together. And so that's what I, I use that quite often, actually, and it's, very, it's been quite successful so far. So that's, I think that's, I think, believe that's it. Yep, so that's it uh, as far as examples. But these are the things that I'm doing to try to establish the, those online learning communities, the collaboration, social cohesion, and then the capstone with the peer assessment. Yeah, so that's it. So any questions at all or Projects comments? about the peer assessment. First of all, thank you so much. I learned yes. tons today. We always think we, we, we have our own experiences and then we learn about others and figure out what we can do. Mm -hmm. So with, with the peer feedback, um, is the feedback <coughs> available for all of the, the other students to see? Or is it private? Okay, so when I break up, yes, I, yes. You, you can go two ways with this. Okay. One yes. is it can be, but uh, so far I have elected to keep the feedback within the team, the group dynamic, because I feel that they they um, feel more safe in, in because they've established a bit of rapport mm -hmm. of, with their small teams, mm -hmm. and they're, I think, better able to provide authentic, real feedback to their cohort members. So that's how I'm doing it so right. far. All right, so try the other way. That's and fine. how does that work? Very well. Okay. Um, not for something huge, yeah. uh, because you know it's higher risk. Um, I've had students give uh, peer feedback to student presentations mm -hmm. online on on uh, in Moodle, mm -hmm. and so each each group that has a presentation online, they did it in class. The students have a rubric, and they have uh, specific instructions, and yeah. so um, they're supposed to upload in a public way um, uh, questions for the group and or recommendations for improvement. Mm -hmm. So they can't say, oh, they can say good job, but that doesn't, you know, mean, um, and they have to be specific. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I've been doing that for a long time. So it has to be neutral language. It's non-judgmental. That's right. And and uh, I I monitor that. So I pulled out maybe one in in 500 postings. One I pulled mm -hmm. down, um, and that was well because then six students see other people's feedback, yeah. and if they're uncertain as to how to respond, it gives them a bit of uh, uh, an example or an idea. Of so, we've so been, we've been good. in a way, I, I guess I do a variation of that because uh, when I set them up in groups, they provide the feedback with one another, mm -hmm. and I, I keep that yes. pretty much confidential. But those, like the example of the, um, if I post a, 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 an item on teamwork, for instance, mm -hmm. so those those groups are supposed to work together, um, come out come up with some results, and then they can discuss and provide feedback, yes. you know, uh, with, with one another. But then they do post that yes. to the larger group, okay. and then. Other teams are supposed to respond to a minimum of two okay. other uh, comments, mm -hmm. or two other postings, Yes. because I want to have that dialogue. So I guess in a way yes, I am yes, sort of doing that. <clears throat> yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I do do that. And I'm uh, really, as I said, I, I've just completed my research, right? So I'm really, I, there's so much more I know I can do. So I'm really at the beginning stages, I think. And so I'm, I'm trying things that mm -hmm. hopefully will, will make the learning experience richer for the students. 
I suspect that not all of it will be successful, and I'll have to maybe pull back a little bit, I'm sure. But that's, I think, the part and parcel. So I, I'm not afraid of trying things. And um, as long as it makes sense from a student learning perspective, then I'm going to try it. together and I get to present, present this low tech but I hope um, low tech is good yeah low tech is good uh, a token of appreciation thank you yes. interesting to see